Welcome to Streets and Eats, the podcast where we want to inspire your next trip by telling you about some fantastic destinations and the best food to eat while you're there. Now remember, until the world opens completely back up and you feel safe to travel again, use this time to research and plan. And we're here to help you with that. In this episode, we're taking you to London. London is one of our favorite cities in the world. But just so you know, it's really Mm, not cheap. No, it's not. (laughs) To go to London, you're not using the euro. You're not using the dollar. You're using the pound. And right now, the dollar is only worth 72 pence. You're looking at hotel prices around $150 to $200 a night. Minimum. Minimum. A pint of beer costs more than five pounds or $7. Minimum. And you're going to want to drink some pints, let me tell you. Right. And a Sunday roast at one of our favorite gastropubs, the Jug Hare, is a minimum of 22, 24 pounds or $33 per person. But it's worth it. It's so worth it. So London takes some budgeting and some planning ahead of time. But be prepared and just don't get hung up on the cost. Otherwise, why bother? Yeah, so, there's lots of other cheaper destinations that you can go. But... I think everybody wants to go to London at least once in their life. So just be ready for it. That's right. So that's our disclaimer because we love London and we go, well, we've gone so many times. I can't even tell you. We'd like to go at least once a year. Yeah. It's a pretty easy city to get to. And we were living in Europe for a while and from Germany, there was a cheap flight directly from, where did we go from? Nuremberg into Stansted, one of London's three international airports. It was pretty easy to do and it was cheap. And so why not go for the weekend? Now, it was cheap to get there. Wasn't cheap once you were there. And And not only that, but for us living in Europe, yeah, it was easy to get to for a weekend. But if you're going to London, I think you need more than a weekend. Yeah, you can do it in a weekend. But if you're coming from... The States, especially, uh, you're probably not going to be coming for the weekend. So, and you're probably also not going to be coming into Stansted. You'll be going into Heathrow, Heathrow, uh, which is one of the other major airports. The other one is Gatwick Uh, and Stansted and Gatwick. They say they're London, London, Stansted, London, Gatwick, but they're really not in London. They're much further out. Stansted is, I think, about an hour by train. So you need to really plan on that if that's where you're flying into. So actually, so how much time do you need for London? Like I said, I don't think a weekend is enough time unless you happen to live in Europe or you happen to be somewhere close enough that you can go back over and over and over again because you're not going to get uh, much done in a couple of days. Or if you're flying into, like I said, London and then out of London Stansted to another destination somewhere or spending more time in England or in Ireland, then two days at the beginning of your trip or the end of your trip is a really kind of a good way to get a taste of London. Or you could fly into Heathrow for a couple of days, do London, and then go see other parts of England or Wales or Scotland or whatever as well. So it's a nice jumping off point is what we're trying to tell you. Even though you could easily spend a week or even a fortnight, which is two weeks, That's two weeks. <laughs> um, to see London and still not to get to see everything because there's it's a city. It's huge and it's wonderful and there's lots to do. So we, we get that question a lot. How much time do you need? Uh, and really, that's a very personal question. First of all, how much time do you have? What's your vacation time allotment? Uh, and then what kind of person are you? If If you're planning a trip to London and you're not a city person you're probably going to get really burnt out. Well, I don't like pounding the pavement too many days in a row myself. Really quickly. So you won't want as much time in the city all at once. And you might want to break it up with getting out into the countryside for a while. But if you love cities and you really want to experience as much as you can a week or two weeks is okay. Yeah. There's plenty to do. You'll never do everything no matter how long you stay. Okay, so you figured out how long you're going to be there. Now it's a matter of deciding where you should go. The places that we've picked are really the most important, full Monty, quintessentially British things to do in London. Yeah. They are not 
I mean, if you're going to be there for longer, there's so much more to do. But these are the top, top, You should top. not go to London and leave without doing these things. Exactly. Right. And it's kind of a long list and it probably is too much for a weekend. So if that's you, if you're that person who's just flying in and looking for a few things to do, then you'll want to pick and choose from the list. Uh, but if you're there for a week, this would definitely fill up a week. And you could easily be stretched into a two week trip with some other things too. So yeah, don't feel like you need to get everything in. That's kind of what we tell people uh, when they're asking about, you know, how, how much should I plan on doing when I get to a city? What should I, what all should I be packing in? You know, that's, that's another personal decision. If you are the type of person that likes to pack things in and go to as many museums as you can, in a day, well, then it would be much different for me, for example, where uh, my limit is pretty much one museum in a day. After that, I find myself really walking through and not really experiencing the museum. So you plan that accordingly. So what's the first thing you think they should do? Well, the absolute number one thing to do in London for every single person is to see the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. Oh, yeah. I mean, I it makes me laugh every time I think about the first time I took you there. <laughs> and instead of playing anything like Here Comes the Queen or whatever, whatever. what do they play? New York, New York, New, New York. York. I'm like, are you kidding me? The but band anyway. comes marching down the street. Yeah. And the first tune comes out. And I'm thinking, I recognize that song. Wait. That's New York, New York. We're but, in London, London. What's going on? <laughs> We're in London, London. <laughs> but anyway, it is, uh, I mean, it's just so iconic. You've got to go there. The palace itself is amazing. Make sure you look up. Is the flag flying? If it is, you know the queen's in residence. If not, she's at one of her other castles. But they oh, still darn. do the changing of the guard, <laughs> oh, whether the, she's yeah. there or not. Yeah, so. whether they're not there or not. But they but, don't do it every day. Uh, one, sometimes in the summer. June and July, they June used to do July. it every day, but this year is a little bit different because we're coming off the pandemic. But next year, hopefully, life will be back to normal. The rest of the year, it's only um, shown Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and Sundays. And it starts about 1045 and lasts for about an hour. So it's over at 1145. Right. But, and, but you don't want to show up at 1045. No. Because it gets crowded, of course. Um now, do you need to get there at 930 and camp out and grab a spot? Probably not. Probably not. But if you get there around 10, 15, 10, 20, bring a coffee with you so you have something to drink, you'll be fine. And you'll be in the spot where you can actually see what's happening and hear what's happening and maybe even get some photos. Uh, the other thing that is super iconic, I think, is Big Ben. Look, kids, Big, Big Ben. Big Ben, Parliament. <laughs> Parliament. If you've seen European <laughs> Vacation, you know what we're talking about. Chevy Chase driving around the family uh, in their first traffic circle, which, of course, was a thing in and of itself before they had traffic circles in the States. Uh, now it's a little bit more now common. People probably watch that and say, what's so funny about being stuck in a traffic circle? No one ever gets stuck in a traffic circle. Well, they used to. But they used to. Anyway. It, Big Ben is a great place to go. And of course, Westminster Abbey um, is the church that like everything important happens. People are buried there that you just can't believe. Just off the top of my head, uh, you've got Sir Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Edward V. Jeffrey Chaucer, my Jeffrey, favorite. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, well, they're not just buried there. That's also where most of the royals are married. Uh, and it's where the kings are crowned or queens yeah, or queens that's as right. the case is right now. Okay. So one of the most important places to go and the one with the best, best stories is the tower of London. In fact, you need to take a beef eater tour and get all the grisly stories of the tower of London, because that's where everybody was arrested, dragged and hung. imprisoned and hung. Heads or cut off. <laughs> well, but wait a minute. I think we have to explain what a beef eater is. I'm a beef eater. You're a beef eater. Oh, beef eater is a British guard for the Tower of London. For the Tower of London. That's their title. And, they, and you can recognize them because they have that beautiful red coat 
and the short, the short furry black hat, not the tall furry black hat, right? Um, I didn't know there was a difference in sizes. Yes, but it's definitely furry. We'll go with that. Oh, uh, maybe maybe I'm thinking of something. <laughs> yeah, different. I don't know what you're thinking of, but anyway, um, the Tower of London gets really really busy, especially in summer. And it takes almost the whole day to go through. So make sure you buy your tickets in advance. And I would say try and get there pretty early so that hopefully you can avoid some of the crowds. Yeah. Uh, some of the highlights are. Yeah. Well, don't miss the Ravens, of course. But more important, the crown jewels. You definitely, everybody who visits London has to go to the Tower of London, wait in the line to see the crown jewels, and then get on the little conveyor belt that takes you past the crown jewels you're and, not going to linger there and oh by the way it doesn't stop so you know don't don't wait for it to stop to take your picture it goes through at a nice slow pace so you get a chance to see everything and if you want you can always get back in line and, and go again which uh, we've done a few times because you can't see it that fast yeah and it's a bit of an experience it's unexpected uh, there's always something going on there. I mean, when we were there last, they had a Shakespeare play on the green, which was pretty interesting and fun to watch as well. Um, there's also a great uh, weapons museum, armory museum that you shouldn't miss. There's so much to see yeah. and so many placards to read that you'll spend the day. Don't there. plan on doing anything else that day, except for maybe going to the pub, because it is just. It's mind blowing. There's so much information and and really interesting things to see and do there. I love it. Yeah, it's I love one of my the favorite, tower. favorite places. Uh, and when you're done, of course, you can walk out through the main gate and then head down to the Thames, where you're going to get the best views of the Tower Bridge. I think most people, Americans at least, think of the London Bridge, and when they're in the when they think of the London Bridge, they're actually seeing the Tower Bridge in their heads. Um, that's the one with the two towers and it's a suspension bridge and it's just an amazing bridge. The London bridge is just a regular old bridge. Even though we used to sing the song London bridges falling down when we were kids, it probably should have been the tower bridge because that's a much more interesting bridge. It's pretty. Um, one of the places that I think everyone needs to go is the British museum. Now the British museum is free. So you can go anytime. But of course, there are so many amazing artifacts stored there that it it's always busy as well. And you might want to go two or three times so that you don't get overwhelmed by the crowds. Right. Um, one of the places, one of the things we couldn't wait to see was the Rosetta Stone. I mean, I just, I'm, it was like I was fanning on it. I just right. love the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> Fan girl on the Rosetta Fan Stone. Fan girl because cool. What a thing, right? We can the, also see Egyptian mummies, um, artifacts from all kinds of dead civilizations like Mesopotamia. Yeah. All those archaeological artifacts that were collected. Reed stole. Over the years. Some of them, I'm sure most of them are legitimately collected, but the, the British military traveled the world with all of their colonies and they acquired a lot of artifacts. Now, they are in museums, which and being is great, well taken care of. and being taken care of. And you get to go see them for free. So, pros and cons, pros and cons. Um, another thing that I think is a must while you're in London is go to a West End play. It's just like being in New York and having to go to Broadway. You want to go down to the West End, and there's tons of different shows being um sold out every night couple of there is theaters. even a place where you can get half price tickets so mm -hmm. ask your hotelier where exactly to go but really again this is going to take some planning uh especially if you have a play in mind that you really, really want, want to watch see. that's true uh a few of our trips to london were based on getting those tickets so we didn't really do any other planning beforehand other than getting the tickets once we got the tickets and we knew when we were going to be able to go that's when we planned the rest of the trip um, so if a play is something that you're interested in or a specific play a specific play then really that's where you want to start your planning for example one of the reasons we went was to see harry potter and the cursed child and i mean it's a british book right and everybody's supposed to be speaking with a british accent so that was something that we really wanted to do in England. Yeah. Where we could get the full 
full experience. Experience, exactly. And oh my gosh, it was that? amazing. It was at the Palace Theater. It was at the Palace Theater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we've seen other things too. One of our favorite comedians um, is Miranda Hart. And she was playing in Little Orphan Annie yeah. as the matron, what the matron, the matron of the orphanage, and she's she's just so perfect. I mean, if you know her, she did it quite well. She she was so her, and that made our day. So too. even though it was a, a story, show. a play that everyone's super familiar with, uh, in that case, it was fresh and it was fun. Yeah, uh, we've seen tons of stuff there. We love going to the West End, um, St. Paul's Cathedral. Yeah. Can't miss it. It's right on the Thames. And in recent history, I think the most important thing that's happened there is Prince Charles married Lady, Lady Diana. Diana. But of course, I mean, the it's been there for well over 300 it's years. An impressive edifice, right? It was the tallest building in London for over 300 years. I think up until 1963 or something like that. Um, it's still an impressive part of the skyline. And uh, you can't miss it. Now, uh, do you need to spend a lot of time there? I suppose if you're uh, Anglican, you might want to go to a mass. But for other visitors, walk in, admire the the building itself, architecture. The architecture is what I was looking for, <laughs> and maybe feed the pigeons. Feed the pigeons. <laughs> Well, how much? How much? Two a puns, tuppence, a tuppence, tuppence, a bag. What? What movie is that from? Mary Poppins. Okay, so anyway, that's St. Paul's Cathedral, and what's another thing that's nice about the cathedral is it's straight across the Millennium Bridge from two other important sites, which I wouldn't necessarily think are important on your first visit to London, but they're but they're great sites all the mm. same. One is the uh, reconstruction of Shakespeare's Globe Theater, and the other is the Tate Modern. Yeah, both definitely worth visiting. Again, as uh, in the secondary list, unless you are into either one of those, modern art or Shakespearean, then you'd want to catch a play in the Globe, uh, and you definitely want to check out the latest exhibits at the Tate. After that, uh, another thing you really shouldn't miss is the Portobello Road Market. Uh, it's a street market that happens every Sunday. You're going to find antiques, vintage clothing, uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. It's just fun walking down the street and seeing the cool houses on both sides. And if you've seen the movie Notting Hill, it, you'll be familiar with it. Yeah, it, it's just, I don't know, it just reminds you of something that's very, very British, very English. Yeah, and it's got a great vibe. It's just fun to walk around. People walk. As you go down the hill towards the bottom, you come to a um, tube station. And right in that area, there's also, of course, a big food market. Mm-hmm. And while we were there, it was so hard to choose what to eat. Oh, uh, yeah. We were. It was good food. We, we ended were, up with what? Grilled cheese? Yeah, grilled cheese of all <laughs> things. They were the best grilled cheese sandwiches I've ever had. Delicious. Um, and one place that I think everybody needs to go is Harrods, um, department store for any shopping or just for browsing. You you can't, you just can't imagine the opulence of Harrods. Um, one time we were in there with the kids, with our daughters when they were teenagers. Um, and we were in the stuffed animal section. Which is an entire room. And some of those stuffed animals are almost, I wouldn't say they're life size, but they're huge. Some are larger than life, actually. Yeah, they're just huge. Just an impressive array of stuffed animals. Stuffed animals. Like everything you can imagine and most things you can't imagine. And then there's also a Lego model of Herod's itself, which is also huge. Yeah. It was about, what, four feet long? It was gigantic. Gigantic. And one of the things that we did while we were there, which was so much fun, I don't know um, if you guys have ever really paid attention, but honeycomb seems to be a huge thing in in British cooking and British desserts especially. And while we were there, they were having you make your own honeycomb bar. So, well, we had to do it. I mean, yeah, it was so cool. Anytime you can do your own anything, make your own anything, it's worth doing. But the whole shopping center and the whole building is just 
over the top. I could spend hours in the toy area alone Maybe. because everything is like hands on. You can try out all the different toys or or gadgets and yeah, you could just get lost in there for hours. And they have good cafes, too. So it's a good place to go and try different foods that you haven't tried yet. Speaking of food. Speaking of food. So what do you need to eat when you're in London? Well, of course. Okay. So British food really gets a good bashing. Yeah, it does. It really does. I, people say British food. Uh, that's not for me. But I grew up on British food. I lived in England when I was a, a preschooler. And, you know, I I love British food. But on top of that, I think it's gotten a bad rap. Well, I maybe think, because that bad rap, it's gotten better. Who knows? Maybe. But it is better now. And I don't know about you, but I love it. Yeah. Fish and chips. Steak and kidney pie. What else? Lots of good stuff. Bangers and mash. All that pub food, especially, we just love. Well, if you're going to look for fish and chips, you could. It used to be. Let me just jump in here. Okay. Fish and chips, I can remember when I was a kid. And it used to be that they would have the fish and the chips wrapped in newspaper. And you'd put your uh, malted vinegar right in it, wrap it up, take it home. All in one wrapping. And Well, then they went, you know, newspaper print probably isn't the healthiest. <laughs> so they went to plain paper. And then so years ago when the kids, when our kids were little, you, they didn't have anything other than plain paper to wrap it in. But now they've even gone further and now they pretty much put it in a cardboard box. And that's how you get efficient yeah. chips. So it's hard to find it wrapped in paper still. You can go to a pub and you can get fish and chips or you can go to as a, a chippy meal. as a pub meal. But I'm here to tell you that is not the way to eat fish and chips. No. You want to get it takeaway. Takeaway. If you, you have, can, wrapped in paper. Or if, if not, can, even even the in the box. Is okay. But, but the trick here is that you've got to you've got to be liberal with that malted vinegar and you need to just put That's as much all. on as you can. You like it on everything. The I French love it on everything. And, the and then I like to close the box and I don't want to eat it for at least 10 minutes. That's why I'm getting it to take away. It's nice and soggy. I like it to get all soaked in there because that is, oh, it is good. That just brings back memories. It's just so good to me. I like a little bit more crisp on mine, a little more crunch, but I like it like that too. And this is usually going to be a pretty big serving. So one's enough for so two. So one's enough for two. You might want to share, although. When Erica was there, when she was what five, five she's at five. the time, she got she'd had enough of having to share her sister's fish and chips or so, everything for that matter because so she was five. We we're in a chippy, ordering our takeaway, and she pipes up, "I want my own fish and chips." <laughs> so that's been a, a long-standing family quote. Yeah. I want my own fish and chips, please. If we're like my own. Where did you get that from? <laughs> I want my own fish and chips, but that's, you know, you know how kids are. It was fun. Um, but if you're going to try fish and chips, you get there and, and maybe you won't be ready for this, but they have a whole fish menu of which fish to pick. And I suggest that you either go with the two traditional kind of cheapy fishes, which is cod and haddock, or there's a little bit more expensive one that they don't always have called Spanish mackerel. That's my favorite. There are three or four other kinds that we've either, we just never bothered to have. So they might be good. I don't know. And if you're not sure, ask the, ask the, ask the chippy what chippy. he suggests. What do they suggest? And you'll either get the one that they're trying to get rid of because it's the oldest, <laughs> or you'll get whatever they think is the freshest. But either way, it's all fried and it's delicious. It really is. And like I said, you can eat it in, but you shouldn't. Take it away. Don't, don't bother. Just find a park bench or a picnic Take it back table. to the hotel. Go sit on the side of the Thames. Yeah. Something. Make a picnic out of it. It's good. But fish and chips, that should be at the top of your list because it's nothing like long trips. You got to go. And there's, there's <laughs> chippies everywhere. Um, Poppy's fish and chips always pops up when, when you do a search. It's one of the more popular ones. It's, you can take away, but it's more of a touristy sit down, sit in type place, uh, and it's good. It's not my favorite, though. but it's not our favorite. Shoreditch, Shoreditch fish and chips. I like because of the name. I think the Brits have great names. Shoreditch, how wonderful! But their fish is also really good. Um, but 
the reality is if you do a Google search for fish and chips near you and just check the reviews, go with something over a four, you really, you're not going to go wrong. Yeah, I agree. You don't have to travel across the town or the city for the best. Yeah. It's the awful. other thing that I really love, and I think it took Jim a little bit longer to love it than I, than me, because like I said, I lived there when I was a kid, were the savory pies. And <laughs> I remember the first time we went to uh, England, Devin was just a baby. So that was a long that time was a ago. Long time ago. And the first thing I, I couldn't wait to order was a steak and kidney pie. And Jim was just like, yeah. who wants to eat steak and kidney? I mean, come kidney, on, the what? steak, sure. And when I saw steak and ale on the menu, now I was all in. But not for the kidney. But let me tell you, after you try it. It's pretty good. It's really good. I still prefer the steak and ale, but uh, a good steak and kidney pie is pretty good too. But the savory pies are just that. They're, you know, you can have them for lunch. You can find them anywhere. And there's different um, choices as far as what you can eat. And there are so many choices I couldn't begin to tell you. But I know one really popular one is a curry chicken. Uh, we like the chicken and leek. Yeah, that's good too. There's the, just a mushroom one, so you can get some that are vegetarian. Mm, vegetarian. Um, all kinds of different stuff, and and really, it's just a matter of what your taste is. But also, um, I, I would say try them all. Yeah, and it's a good, affordable meal. Packs it all right in one nice punch. Uh, they're delicious. You can find them all over the place, not just in pubs. Um, you can get a good pie at a pub, a chippy. Markets usually have food stalls with pies. Uh, the Ginger Pig in Borough Market, which is another place you should go, has a great pork pie. Even gas stations. And I also think you can go to places, places like the grocery stores, like Sainsbury's. Right. And they'll have like a deli counter like we have in our grocery stores. And they'll have pies there. I mean, you can literally get pies everywhere. And you should. Because they're that good. Yeah. Almost go. the cheaper they are, the better they are. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Not always, uh, but go more than once. Try them all. Okay. Uh, another thing, this is a little bit more upscale, I guess. Uh, that's the Sunday roast. And what a tradition it is mm -hmm. because a Sunday roast, you pretty much, if you go to a decent um, one, you have to make reservations because people have their favorites and they take their entire family and they'll have, yeah, it's a real family tradition. It's a family tradition where they've got all the extended family. Like, we'll have a Sunday dinner. They have it out at a restaurant, and they're going to have Sunday roast. That way, everybody can have what they want for their main meal. Right. You don't just have one roast beef, for instance, because maybe not everybody likes roast beef. So you go out for the Sunday roast at a restaurant or a pub, and you have choices between roast chicken, roast beef, roast lamb, duck. Who knows? They, I mean, they get, those are the traditionals, but they can get kind of upscale, I guess, and interesting, but they're going to come with all the sides, Yorkshire pudding, vegetables, my favorite potatoes, the duck fat roasted potatoes. You're oh, always going to get so your good. tubers, your parsnips and your, right. So if you've never had parsnips and you've always heard about it, this is where you're going to have parsnips. Um, and it's just so good. So usually a Sunday roast um, comes with that. That's the main meal. And sometimes you'll have afterwards and you'll be able to order your pudding or your dessert. And they have lots of good desserts as well. Yeah. Um, so you'll order the Sunday roast. That's how you ask for it. And you tell them which meat you want, if there's choices. And if there's choices on the sides, you specify your sides. But you're going to pay the set basically a menu price. Uh, and And you'll get it all delivered right to your table. One of a lot of times family style. So family everybody's style. sharing in on the vegetables and things. And it's on Sundays. So that's why it's called a Sunday roast. And that's why you really need a reservation. But we found as we were driving around the country, we found a restaurant called the Sunday roast. And, and it's a chain. It's a chain, but they've turned it into every day is Sunday roast day. So you can go in and get your Sunday roast on a Monday or a Tuesday. And it's a chain, but it was still pretty good. It was okay. If you don't have any other options, good. that's a good way to experience a Sunday roast. Um, but a better way, I think, really, is to find a carvery, which, again, is uh, usually in a pub. 
or a pub style restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be the same idea where they have roasted a few different meats and carvery style, they'll slice off the one you want and you'll get most of the same, most of the same fixins. I think you that you would with a Sunday roast. Yeah, I, I don't think you get quite as much. They usually have only a couple of choices, but almost always you'll get ham. Um, you'll, roast beef. A lot of times they'll have cold cannon, which is mashed potatoes with cabbage in it, which is one of my favorite things, and you know some kind of veg. Um, but pay attention because. They might have beef that night or they might have roast chicken right. one night. So just, you so know. So if you can't get in on a, on a Sunday roast somewhere, that's an option. Yeah. For something similar. So the next one, next food you should try in London is definitely bangers and mash. Now, this is the story I always hear about Corky growing up in England about the bangers. Not necessarily the mash. I'm sure it was no, served just, with it, but. No, because it was in the morning. So it was, it was breakfast. Okay. Daytime. So bangers and mash is sausage and mashed potatoes. It's a very typical pub food. You can find it in almost every pub. It's usually served with a really rich onion gravy. Uh, and everything is piping hot and steaming. Oh, it's so delicious. Enjoy it with a pint of beer down at your local. Or we found a restaurant in London called Mother Mash that specializes in... You didn't tell the story. What story? About Quirky. Well, tell it. Well, why didn't you tell you it? You didn't jump in, so I'm waiting. Go ahead. No, you said this is the story I've always heard. <laughs> well, okay. So the story about the bangers, it's not much of a story. It's not, but it's a but cute. But she was a, a very young child, and she went to a, probably a preschool. It was a private preschool in Ipswich. Somewhere, yeah, okay, in Ipswich. And every day they would have bangers for breakfast. And she describes the smell as being the most heavenly thing ever. Now, I'm not really a sausage lover, She's but I not. do like bangers and mash or British sausage, I guess, just because probably of this memory. But I would, my mother would drive me to school, in my little British uniform, and you would get out of the car and the smell of the sausages just wafted right to you and it was heavenly it was amazing so even though i don't heavenly. really eat sausages anywhere else i definitely love bangers yeah so that's the story so that's the story of corky and the bangers it's a good story she doesn't like sausages so whenever we go somewhere and they have bangers and mash i'm always shocked when she orders it but i guess it's got that sentimental Nostalgic feeling. Nostalgic feeling. And we did find a great restaurant called Mother Mash. Uh, I think it's down in the Harrods area. But we'll share our Google map with all the food places on it in our show notes. So you can find it too. Um, but you go in and their menu is one of these like design your own meal type things. So you choose your type of mash, potatoes, parsnip, cheesy, all kinds of different choices. You choose your sausage filling, the traditional pork and black pepper. Cumberland. Can, Cumberland style. Or you can get a curried or a chicken or there's a vegetarian sausage. Like five or six choices. And then you pick your gravy for it as well. So again, that traditional onion is my favorite. Um, but they also have pies. So you could replace your bangers if you don't want to try the bangers. Or if you already had bangers and you want to try a pie, they have really good pies. So you could replace the sausage with a steak and kidney pie, for instance. And they have amazing desserts as well. And their desserts are really good. It's a great place to go for a sticky toffee pudding, which is another food that everybody should have. At least. At, at least, least once, once on a trip. Once you've if had it, you'll probably want it more often, but it's a little bit sweet. A little bit calorie, lots of calories. calories. Um, but it's a it's a date pudding. Now, when you say pudding, we think of like Jello pudding, right? Very soft. Eat it with a spoon. Um, a British pudding. This one in particular is much more cakey. It's like a steamed cake. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, it's soaked in toffee sauce, and my favorite served with a hot vanilla custard. Oh, so good! And it's sticky and sweet. And tangy from the dates. 
uh, and just delicious. And even if you don't like dates, I don't like dates. Um, Jim loves dates. I love dates. Yeah. I don't like dates. And I, I mean, this has got to be one of my favorite things on, on the earth. Right. That's how good it is. Especially just, just smothered, just swimming and vanilla swimming custard. And, vanilla, and warm vanilla custard. Oh, I cannot tell you how good it is. It's okay. So the last thing we're going to add here for food is a high tea. I mean, you've always heard of that. Everybody says, you know, well, especially if you've read Alice in Wonderland, but even if you haven't, high tea in, in London is something you need to do. I never really knew what it was. I thought it was just tea in the afternoon. Well, first of all, tea means a lot of things because right. the British speak a different language than we do. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but tea really means supper or dinner. The afternoon meal. The afternoon meal. Even though they might have a meal afterwards. I don't know. Whatever. That's dinner. That's dinner. Yeah. Anyway, know. so high tea really is finger sandwiches of different kinds, um, some small baked treats, um, petty fours or scones or danishes tarts. or tarts, all kinds of different things. And of course, a tea to go along with them. Um, some just normal British black tea or, you know, other you can ones. get coffee too if you wanted it. Yeah, Instead, you can get anything you want to come drink, on, it's actually. high tea. You got to have tea. Um, and, and they go from super swanky, like at the Savoy, for probably fifty, at least $50 a person. Yes. To much, 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 much lower and more accessible. It depends on what you want to do. If you're really into the swanky or the quirky, there's like science ones, there's themed ones. I mean, right. high tea is the thing. So you definitely want to enjoy some way do some research yeah but for us it. we're not very well that's not really our thing no, we don't no. want to spend our money on swanky necessarily when you can get a tea at pretty much any coffee shop a patisserie or... yeah so well the one we found is a chain and i think we've done this twice before a show actually uh, we had time before the cursed child and we found a high tea at Patisserie Valerie, which is, like I said, it's, it's a, a chain. It's an upscale chain. Um, delicious patisserie, good tea. You can't go wrong, really. And, and it's cheap. I think it was only like 14 or 15 pounds. It's probably a little bit more For now. the tray of some sandwiches. Yeah, what you get is a three tiered tray, a pot of tea with a pot of tea. So and it's, it's a patisserie. Um, it, okay, so even if you're not into tea, maybe. Maybe you're a guy and you don't want to go and have high tea by yourself. I get it. I get it. No matter what, one of the, the most important parts of the high tea or any tea is to have a scone. And they say more like scone, but I say scone. That's how Paul Hollywood says it. Paul Hollywood says Paul scone. Ho scone. Um, and oh my gosh, it, there's all kinds of different scones. Um, probably the most traditional is like a raisin scone. Um, but the best is the kind of scone that comes with the cream, the clotted cream. Clotted cream and, and raspberry, like a raspberry jam, jam or strawberry yeah. jam. Oh, That's delicious. So good. Or the lemon, lemon curd. We've had all kinds. Yeah. And you you can't go wrong with the scone. And some black tea with cream and milk. So yummy. No, not cream and milk. Sugar and milk. Sugar and milk. Because white you tea. have two different kinds of tea, a black tea and white tea. So if you want sugar and milk in your tea, that's called white tea. And that's what you tell the waitress or waiter. Okay. So one more thing. This is not necessarily a food that you have to try, although you can get food there. But it's an ex a food but experience. But it's a food experience that everyone should do in London. And that's a pub. In general. In general. Now, there are pub crawl tours that you can take, which if you've got the time, that's a great way to spend an evening. Uh, you'll hear some fun stories, some interesting stories, maybe even some scary stories, and try a few different beers at the same time. Uh, that's a lot of fun. But really, you just want to find a pub near your hotel or somewhere along your route that takes you back to your hotel each day where you can stop in and have a pint or two. Kind and of become your own regular. Yeah. Yeah. For the few for the few days that you're there, you can be a regular, at least in your own mind. Um you may never be treated as a regular regular in those few days, but you'll start to feel you'll still hear stories and you'll still get to, a chance to mingle with the locals, enjoy some nice 
what most people call warm beer, warm flat beer. Um, however, I love a cask pulled ale. It is not as carbonated as a beer you would get in the States, but it's much more flavorful and it's much more enjoyable. I love it. Um, you can also try and find, try and get into one of the tried and true, like historical pubs, like the Star Tavern, the Nags Head, the Grenadier. Um, but one of our favorites is the Black Friar, which is in the Black Friar area. Um, but no matter what, go ahead and make your way into the pub, elbow your way up to the bar, get a pint of ale, have it pulled from the cask, or maybe even a apple cider. That's another favorite. Or, or a pear cider. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The idea of the pub is, and they will say this, it's a home away from home. Because it's a place where people go frequently, day-to-day -day basis, and they just sort of tell everybody who's around. Meet their friends. The other locals, the other regulars. Spend coworkers. And, and talk about their regulars. day. Yeah. It's so much fun. I think if you get outside of London, it's even easier to see that pub culture. But even in London, you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. So how do you get around London? That's a very common question. Um, the, the black taxis will whisk you all over the town. If you have three or four people in your party, that's really not a bad option. Well, and even if you just take a black taxi once, it's one of For those iconic things you want to do. So take a black taxi. But don't take it across town. It'll yeah, be too expensive. Just take a short drive. <laughs> but yeah. Um, you cannot pay for the taxi with your Oyster card, which is what we recommend. Uh, as soon as you get there, go to the station, get an Oyster card. I think it's five pounds. Fill it up with maybe 20 pounds to get started. And you can use that. Um, it's like an, it's like a credit card, ATM card. I think most people are familiar with just buying a subway using card. A card for, uh, for paying for your buses and for your subway. Uh, but it pays for all the other transportation besides the black cabs, including, of course, those double decker buses, the river buses, the subway, uh, even a couple of trains that run in the area. Uh, get that, top it off, and you're ready to go. You can get anywhere. Makes life easier. You don't have to be digging in your pockets for change. Right. Uh, at some of the... Uh, the oyster card stops. They give you away free water in the summertime oh, because yeah. they want you to stay hydrated. It's just, it's, it's just a good deal. And really the best way to get around London, unless it's a serious rush hour time is above ground. The tubes will take you all over the different parts of the city, but and pretty fast and for the pretty most part. fast. But if there's not heavy traffic, the bus is almost as fast and there's a lot less walking. And with those double decker buses, you can get up, high above the parked cars and you really get a chance to see the city. So some of them there's, they're going by iconic things to see and you can just sort of wait it out on the bus line until you can get into the very front, the front of the double decker. Yeah, why not? The best view and get some of those really good views of those places. Um, yeah. That's just, one of our favorite things yeah, to do. And just ride around and, and see the city. There's some really cool lines. Uh, the lumber 11 runs from Westminster Abbey to Liverpool Street, and there's a lot of great sites along that one. Um, my favorite is the 42 or the 78 that take you past the Tower of London and across the Tower Bridge uh, and and down past St. Paul's. That's really cool, too. But probably my favorite public transportation in London has to be the Thames River bus. Yeah, because how cool is it that the river taxi, the river bus is just part of the bus line. And so you're getting to ride right down the Thames River on the Oyster card. So it's not free, but it's cheap. It's cheap. Now, you have to be careful when you're going to take a river bus because there's also river cruises that go from the same piers. And they seem very similar. They're a little bit more expensive and they don't go as often. Um, and those aren't a bad option. Some of them you can pay for with your Oyster card, but some you have to buy the tickets separate. Uh, always a good idea to take anything you can on the river anywhere you go or in the bay we always love being on a boat uh, but the river boats are a good fairly inexpensive way of doing that they're not slow they're designed as transportation so you're not going to go put put putting past the tower of london for instance and you certainly can't ask to stop and take a photo yeah. just be ready but take video. it's quite an experience and my favorite one is to go 
Uh, there's a one route that goes from the Westminster all the way up to Greenwich, where you can get out and go to the Greenwich Royal Observatory and the National Maritime Museum, two of my favorite things in London. Again, not necessary so probably not for your the first, first trip, trip, unless you're there for a week or longer. But, they uh, are but cool. the boat ride, whether you do get off and go to those things or you just get back on the boat and go back is definitely a first time trip for sure. So then the next question is, where do you stay? Now, remember we said London is not cheap. Um, so you can, what a lot of people do is they'll stay either on the outskirts or even in another town that has train access to London. Um, and, and we've done that as well. The prices seem a little bit lower. The prices but, seem a little bit lower, but then you end up spending an hour of commute time just to get into the city. So it just... And the cost of doing it's that. It's exhausting. Yeah. It's exhausting to do that. If you're young and broke, then that's the way to do it. You're going to save some money and maybe you can get an Airbnb or something out in some of those towns. A hostel or something. Or a hostel or whatever. But, but overall, like we said earlier, if you're planning a trip to London... Plan a trip to London. Stay in one of the neighborhoods that's well in the center of town, near some of the sites or the the experiences that you plan on taking. Definitely near a tube or a train station or at least a bus stop so you don't have to walk to the transportation. That's important. So when you're looking for good hotels, go to the satellite view of Google Maps and see that it's really worth your while as far as um, how close it is to a tube station, how close it is to a, a bus station or um, some of the sites that you want to see. Uh, we like we like a few different areas of town. Yeah. And we've stayed in three stars, four stars. B&Bs. B- Airbnbs. Not Airbnbs, just B&Bs. We have stayed in Airbnb too. In London? Oh, you're right. But we've also stayed in b We've stayed in them all. We've so stayed in them all. there's lots of options. Um, what we have found with hotels, three stars are Typically not a little bit shabbier than maybe the state. Not the same quality you would expect in a three star in other places. All the hotels are expensive, so even the three stars are a little bit high. We stayed in one because we were more concerned with the cost. And what we discovered and we had after a whole that bunch trip, of people with us. Yeah, but what we discovered after that trip is the four stars are enough nicer to make a difference, not too much more expensive. Uh, and it's worth it. It's worth your comfort to go a little bit more than what you think is a good price and stay in a nicer place. So a couple of places we stayed that were like that were the Double Tree, which was oh, near yeah. the Victoria Victoria Palace Theater. One of the places that so we wanted to see a I play. I guess that's another thing to go with when you're looking for a hotel. You know, where are you going to be spending most of your time in London? And try to get somewhere there. So you're not spending all that time commuting. So that's, we stay at the Double Tree because it's right around the, the corner. Especially evening, like for pubs or restaurants yeah. or evening activities. Yeah, you don't want to be somewhere where there's nothing nearby. Yeah, I And totally you don't need agree. to be. It's London. There's stuff, there's good hotels everywhere. You just expect to pay a little bit more than you would. Uh, my favorite, though, I think is in the Liverpool Street Station neighborhood. It's where you take the bus from Stansted into London. And it's the last stop in London. So it gets you there. There's a great hotel there called the Andaz London Liverpool Street Hotel. Great breakfast, comfortable rooms. A little bit more expensive, but again, it's worth it. You're not going to be paying that extra cost in transportation because you're already right in London. And it's just a great hotel. Well, we could, honestly, we could talk about London for hours and hours. Um, But this was just really a glimpse into your very first trip into London because there's so much to do and see. We're not even talking about if you stay long enough to do some excursions outside the city right. or I don't know. There's just really, really so much. There's of course many more, many more hotel, uh, museums that you can go to. The Winchester war rooms is a great place. Lots uh, of good stuff. Lots of them. Um, but no matter what, it will be a trip of a lifetime. And like we always say, 
don't fill up your schedule so much that you can't be a little bit spontaneous because you're going to find things that appeal to you that we can't even think of. That's right. So leave yourself some room to do that. And your vacation, so it should not be stressful. That's right. All right. Thanks for joining us at Streets and Eats, where we want to encourage you to savor the adventure. Join our private Facebook group, Streets and Eats. Just answer a few questions and we will get you in there and you can join in the conversation. Please remember to hit the subscribe button and tell all your friends. We really appreciate you guys listening and ciao Ciao for for now. now.